all coming out today. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me, and I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Jason Wong. I am a uh, leadership coach and fractional VP of engineering, which is a fancy way of saying consultant. Uh, <laughs> we have 45 minutes for the session today. Uh, I only have about 30 minutes of talking to do, so we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. I do tend to speak a little quickly, so uh, if I start getting too fast, uh, please feel free to say, uh, to say so, and I'll, I'll do my best to slow down. Um, but uh, today I'm here to talk about introducing some ideas about inclusion into an engineering organization. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, about mid-2017, I stepped into a new role, uh, helping to oversee a group of about 35 engineers in New York City. Just to give you a sense of what that team looked like, of our 35 engineers, uh, we had five women on the team, four Hispanic slash Latinx engineers, uh, one LGBTQ engineer, and no black engineers. And I think, for better or for worse, like I think a lot of people will take a look at this organization and say, hey, you know what, that's, a, that's not bad on the, diversity, not on the diversity side. But we were operating in New York City, and if we look at the population numbers for New York City, uh, you can see actually it is pretty bad, right? Um, and so I thought it was incumbent on me, upon me to bring about some change. Uh, but why now, right? This company, when I joined it, was only about two years old at the time. Like any startup, it faced a ton of business challenges, right? And no one really would have called us out for deferring our diversity and inclusion efforts. And aside from being, this being the right thing to do, I think now is probably the right time to cue like the avalanche of data information that shows why this is a good idea. Uh, so let's get started here. Uh, this one is probably, everyone is probably familiar with the McKinsey Report, right? Companies in the top quartile for gender diversity on executive teams were 21% more likely to outperform on profitability and 27% more likely to have superior value creation. Uh, this one is from the Boston Consulting Group. Companies with above average total diversity had both 19 points higher innovation revenues and nine points higher EBIT margins. Um, from the University of North Carolina, companies with higher diversity announce on average two extra products a year. Uh, let's keep going. From Cal's Research, companies with the highest percentage of women board directors outperform those with the least by 53%. Goodness. Uh, from Harvard Business Review, venture capital firms that increased the proportion of female partner hires by 10% saw on average a 1.5% spike in overall fund returns each year and had 9.7% more profitable exits. Um, and finally, from first round, companies with a female founder performed 63% better than our investments with all male founding teams. Um, so why now? Well, I can honestly say, like in the 20 years that I've been in the technology space, I don't think I've ever worked on a product or feature or release that has had this type of impact on a company, right? I just don't think I, like, I don't think any feature I've released has increased the value of a company by 10%. It's kind of bananas. Um, but if this doesn't convince you, uh, I'll take a little detour and talk a little bit about myself. Uh, prior, in a prior life, I worked for a popular e-commerce site for about seven years. Uh, I started a company when it was about 100 folks uh, and watched it grow to over 1,000. I joined as an engineer and shortly after I started managing a team of three engineers, which grew into an organization of about 85 plus. Um, during that time, my team went from no women to about 35% women. And in my last year there, uh, we actually achieved a 50% hiring ratio between men and, and engineers who identified as women. Um, this was not easy. Um, this took a lot of work. This is also not complete, right? This is not uh, like we ring the bell and, and, and mission accomplished, right? This is just one dimension of all the work we had left to do. Uh, but what I can tell you with absolute certainty um, about having, from having been through this before is that right now is the easiest time, right? There's no easier time than right now. It's easier today to get started today than it will be tomorrow, next week, or even next year. Um, so if you want to save yourself a whole bunch of effort uh, and time, like today is the day to get started. Great, uh, so let's do this. You would think having been through this transition before, it would have been easy for me to get started again. Uh, but that wasn't the case, at least not necessarily for me. I kept running into this problem, this what is water problem, right? This thing, this idea where I'd become so accustomed to the ideas of inclusion and, uh, and the knowledge being in the water that it became really difficult for me to describe and point out all the things I saw that were obviously wrong, right? 
um, and vice versa, marginalizing behaviors are so ingrained in our society, it became difficult for others to understand what I was talking about. Uh, but there's one thing that I did know, and I, like Kate Huston says, like inclusion had to come first. One of the most common questions I get when I talk to technology leaders is, how do I hire more women? Uh, the second most is, like, I'm just a white guy, I don't know what to do. Um, but <laughs> there's a secret to this, right? Um, and it's that hiring is actually the easiest part. The great thing about the past five years is that there now exists a ton of self-identifying talent pools and affinity groups uh, to connect you to whoever you want to uh, hire, right? Uh, Dev Color, Code 2040, Shift.org, Let's Be In This Who Tech, Women In Tech, you name it, there is a group out there that's looking to connect you to the group you're looking to hire. But the question is, what happens after you hire them? And the answer is terrible things, right? <laughs> what's happening, at, what's, is, is, what's probably what's happening at your company right now, right? Pay inequity, uh, career stagnation, Harassment. In a recent New York Times study, about a third of men, this is self-reported, about a third of men had admitted to doing something that could be construed as objectionable or sexual harassment in the workplace in the past year. Assault, right? Who here works at a company with more than 10 men? Raise your hands. Right, so this is, this is not abstract, this is real. Um, so these terrible things are no secret, right? Uh, we have all this data that shows that they are, in fact, real. We are just very reluctant to acknowledge them. And these things disproportionately happen to marginalized people, especially the marginalized people in our companies. And so for me, inclusion had to come first because if I was going to be successful in this effort, I, I knew it was on us to demonstrate that our workplace was going to be safe, welcoming, and deserving of the talent that we're bringing in. So I had to take a step back and be a little more systematic about my efforts. Um, and whenever I have to create clarity around something, I have a particular tool in my toolbox, and that tool is a vision, mission, strategy statement. So here was mine. Uh, vision, a workplace where people of all identities and experiences are understood, appreciated, and fully included in the community, and where equitable treatment and outcomes prevail. Um, does anyone here by chance work at American University? Any relation to American University? Okay, oh, well this might look familiar then because I stole it from you all. Um, which is probably a great time to mention, like just like writing software, you do not have to originate everything on your own, right? There's this community out here that's looking to help you. Uh, this community right here in this room, the people sitting next to you, the people in these hallways. Uh, there's this great thing called the internet. Um, and it turns out any question you have, you can type it into this like little box and then like someone will tell you. Someone on the internet can, has an answer. Uh, mission, uh, to create a company of allies. Uh, allies in general are folks who have privilege, who lend that privilege to enable access and opportunity to others uh, with less privilege. Um, allies are important for many, many reasons. Uh, but for me, this particular mission resonated because it meant if I was successful in making this happen, uh, inclusion would continue on at this company whether I was there or not. Uh, and finally, strategy. Uh, build awareness, provide education, and affect behavioral change. Uh, having a vision, mission, strategy made things a lot easier for me. Right now, I had like really great mouth words to describe what I was trying to do, um, and it had something that would keep me focused. Right, whenever I got stuck in this work, I could pull out the strategy and think like, what's the awareness piece that I, that I, get, that I can do this week? Or like, when's the last time we did an education initiative? Like, let's schedule something for this quarter. Right, so it really helped to sustain me. Um, beyond achieving the mission, I was hoping that this strategy would help us get really good at navigating three particular inflection points that I found to be common stumbling blocks um, in this work. And the first is not complicit to complicit. Um, I think we all live our lives thinking that we're pretty good people, right? Or at least inert enough not to be actively harming others. Um, so the idea that we're complicit in propagating and, and uh, sexism and discrimination and racism is like really tough to take in. Uh, but the systems of oppression that are baked into our everyday lives programs us in ways that we cannot fully comprehend. And so 
this means that we're, we're not, we're, that we are all complicit in some way, right? It's not about whether we are complicit or not, it's how complicit are we and what are we gonna do now that we have awareness of it. Um, the second inflection point is believing in the lived experiences of others. Like once we open ourselves up to hearing from different voices, the next piece is how do we actually start believing what we're hearing? Um, because we live in a world filled with bias, like two people can do the exact same thing and end up in wildly different places. Um, recently, uh, Marco Rogers tweeted about this uh, podcast called Stan uh, Seen on Radio, and their latest season has been on, on the patriarchy. Um, and they came across, like, they talked about this thing called standpoint theory, which was coined by this philosopher named Sandra Harding. Um, and standpoint theory asserts that people on the receiving end of oppressive systems, people at the bottom of social hierarchies, will see things more accurately than the people at the top, right? Which is like incredible. But, but who's making all the decisions, right? The people who have the least probably accurate understanding of what's going on. And so this inflection point is about getting to the point where we default to believing in the lived experiences of others, right? Um, even if they run completely counter to our own. Because again, not only is this the right thing to do, like the insights that we stand to gain from this are invaluable. And the third is uh, investing time and money. Like talk is cheap. Like folks, everyone likes to talk a big game, but when someone comes to you and says, hey, can I have $25,000 for an employee resource group program this year? Or, hey, can I take a week of engineering's time to re rename master slave terminology in our code base? Like you will hesitate. Like it's happened to me, I grew up to, right? And the question is, will you follow through? So the thing about these inflection points is it's not like you cross them once and you're done. Right? You will cross them over and over again as you move along your journey. Right? You'll start to accept one set of lived experiences and still be incredulous of another. You'll encounter one aspect of your complicitness uh, and, and overcome it and then run into yet another aspect of your complicitness. So the hope was that we would get really good at crossing over these inflection points because we're going to be doing it a lot. Um, so what does this strategy look like in action? Uh, on the awareness front, uh, the first thing I did was I introduced myself as a person on the hook for diversity and inclusion. Um, I did this when I, via email when I joined the company, uh, and I kept repeating every time I described my job function. So that meant interviewing candidates, uh, meeting new leaders at the company, uh, onboarding new engineers. I just kept repeating it. Um, and I communicated our vision, mission, and strategy. Just like I did here, uh, I sent out, this is what we're doing, right? And it served, uh, a couple purposes. One, uh, leadership tip, tip here, one of the best ways to gain trust with your organization is to say what you're gonna do and then do it. Uh, so that was the point of this, right? And it served a couple extra purposes. The first was that no one really likes surprise, right? And it's hard to do, you don't wanna do this subtly, like, <laughs> as, uh, and, or uh, covertly, right? And so this was giving people a heads up that we were actually gonna be changing. We're, I was gonna be expecting our behaviors to change over time. Um, and second, at the time, I was all strategy and no tactics. Like, here's where I want to put my efforts. I don't know exactly what efforts these will map to. So this was a way for me to invite people into the process, like help me out. Um, I didn't exactly get a lot of people jumping in, but I think it served me well in establishing that this was going to be a participatory uh, effort. Um, we discussed current events, right? I firmly believe that it's important to talk about the world as it's happening around us. Uh, talking about effect, uh, events that affect your underrepresented minorities can help them feel seen and serve as awareness opportunities for people with privilege who are not affected, right? Uh, so we talked about Black Women's Equal Pay Day, right? Uh, we talked about how we were at the end of July and that represented the number of extra days, right, in 2017 that, a black, that black women on average have to work in order to equal the salary of their white male colleagues. And now this is just one of the many challenges black women face, not only in our workplace, but also in our healthcare system uh, and society at large. Uh, we talked about binary capital. The story broke uh, shortly after I joined the company. And when it broke, I wanted, uh, I talked about how sexual harassment was not uncommon in the workplace, right? Um, I also thanked the women who came forward and tried to use this as an opportunity to educate folks on the myth of false accusations, right? That only somewhere between two and 10% of accusations are false. Uh, there are very, like, this is a well-studied phenomenon and there are actually very, very strict archetypes of people who uh, make false accusations, 
how it is almost impossible to pay someone to make a false accusation. Like there are many real life experiments in trying to make this happen. Um, and that people who come forward instead often have to pay a terrible price and lost job opportunities, social alienation, and retaliation. Right? I wanted my engineering organization to know that this was an act of bravery. Um, and shortly after Binary Capital came out, uh, the Google Manifesto broke. Uh, and this one took a little bit more nuance to talk about, right? I wanted to address the situation without creating a venue for the, the ideas and contents of the memo. Um, so I spoke at the, about the weaponization of ideological diversity, right? Um, and the harms of discussing the worth of individuals in public forums. I also let my folks know that this story broke over the weekend, um, and so many of us have spent our uh, off time supporting other folks and that we were coming into the workplace a little tired, right? So please be kind to one another in the face of that. Uh, these are definitely not the typical types of communications you'd expect out of your leadership team, but I think that's the point. Um, my brain came up with all sorts of reasons not to talk about these things, right? None of these things have directly affected our business. Um, I could have simply waited for someone to bring it up to me before responding. Um, but I had to consider that those reasons were all attempts to uh, that were they, they weren't couched in logic, right? They were all attempts uh, to rationalize the norm. And all of these weird feelings that I was experiencing was more about not wanting to stand out against that norm rather than taking a principled uh, approach. Um, so shortly after these two stories broke, I asked my team to start diversifying their social networks. I gave them a list of underrepresented uh, minorities in tech and I asked them to follow 20 new voices, right? Uh, the goal here was I wanted to shake up their archetype of what engineers looked and sounded like, right? I wanted to bring the voices of marginalized people into our everyday lives. And finally, on the awareness front, we celebrated wins. Um, so changes are really hard to notice over long periods of time. So anytime we made, uh, we acted to create a more inclusive workplace, I made sure we acknowledged the folks who were involved and celebrated those things. A lot of this part of the strategy felt like talking into the ether, right? And I'll be honest in saying that we didn't see a lot of people jumping on board right of the way. Uh, but the key to any successful communication strategy is repetition. And it, the message might not land the first time, it might not land the fifth time, or even the 50th time. But if you keep going, eventually it will. Um, education. This is the piece that I struggle with the most. Inclusion as a topic runs super deep, right? And I am not an expert. Like, they give away degrees in this stuff at colleges. Uh, not only just four-year degrees, but post-graduate uh, post degrees. So who was I to think that I could teach this stuff? Um, so what I did do uh, was uh, I employed the tactic of outsourcing, right? I assembled a reading list of materials so that any time someone approached me about a topic, I could say, here's something that's interesting for you to read. Uh, here's what my reading list looked like at the time. It's very incomplete. It skews heavily towards gender diversity. That's because where I have most of my background. And I'm still learning uh, a lot about intersectionality and how to su support uh, all these other areas and, and branches of diversity. Um, who here has a brown bag or lunch and learn program at their company? Great. Uh, we had one at ours, and so I just grabbed a slot and we talked about allyship. Um, a talk largely based off the work from Toria Gibbs and Ian Malpass, you have the link uh, down here, who are both formerly of Etsy. We talked about uh, what allyship was, uh, why it was important, and the uh, behaviors of effective allies. And that's about all that I got here, right? There wasn't a lot of meat on the bone. Um, and actually, one of the benefits of having that strategy document is that it highlights where I'm deficient, right? It highlights that I needed to do a lot more work in this, in this space. Affecting behavioral change. At the end of the day, this is the one that really matters, right? How do we move from inclusion theater to inclusion reality, right? What are the actual changes that we're going to make, and how are we going to hold ourselves accountable? This is where the discomfort level gets dialed up to 11. Um, so the first thing we tried to do was we tried to improve discourse. Anytime I heard something that was exclusionary, I pulled that person aside and had a private conversation with them about it. Um, thankfully, nothing I witnessed, uh, uh, nothing I witnessed like required a public response, right? Um, but I've definitely been uh, in those situations, and they are super, super uncomfortable. Um, specifically, 
we talked to I talked to people about jokes they made about the LGBTQ community, uh, comments in Slack channels that came at the expense of women, uh, and insensitive word choice. At first, I did this on my own as a as an individual endeavor. Eventually, I got my managers involved, letting them know like, listen, I'm going to be talking to this person who's your report about this incident, so that they could build a sense of what I deemed to be out of bounds. I was definitely not perfect in this, right? I missed a lot of opportunities, uh, but I tried to be as vigilant as I could and I and keep putting the effort in. We removed racist Slack emojis, right? Uh, this was specifically about emojis that represented white power uh, and were being used for comedic purposes. As absurd as it sounds, uh, it is surprisingly easy to make the excuse of, well, he didn't intend to propagate white power, so we'll let it slide. Um, one of the things that makes this work difficult is oftentimes the intent is not there, right? But the impact is nevertheless. Like, you might not intend to get into a car accident, but at the end of the day, your car is broken. So, uh, we, re we removed these. Uh, we changed how we named things. Uh, we didn't have any problems with master slave terminology in our, our database, but we did have a project that was named in a gendered way. Uh, shortly after I joined, we launched this piece of software as part of our, our, our lag ag log aggregation platform called Log Lady. Um, and that sounds innocuous and cute and endearing. But when we anthropomorphize our, techno our technology, we bring with us our subtle and not so subtle biases. So you can imagine you bring this piece of software to your operability review and someone asks the question, well, what happens when Log Lady goes down? Yuck, yuck, yuck. Um, or you're baking a quiche on a quiet Saturday morning and the pager goes off, right? Because Log Lady is suffering an outage. And you exclaim, Log Lady, that effing bee, right? Um, Amelia Karake has this concept of inclusion debt, right? And if by talking about your technology, you start to accrue debt, like you're gonna be in trouble. Because it turns out that technology organizations talk about their technology all the time. So for me, uh, I would just rather avoid the situation entirely. Uh, we also started doing uh, quarterly compensation practice with, uh, with my managers. Compensation calibration is great for all sorts of reasons. I think Jess mentioned many of them in the earlier talk uh, today. Um, and if you're curious about doing it for yourself, there's a link here to a spreadsheet made by Lara Hogan um, to, for you to get started. But in this context, we're particularly interested in two vectors. The first was uh, pay discrepancies, equal pay for equal work, right? Were we paying folks fairly and equitably? And the second was career, the second was career progression. Uh, were our underrepresented uh, members, uh, minorities, moving through the career ladder at the same pace as their overrepresented peers? Um, if you're lucky, you will find only minor pay discrepancies here. Um, if you're like me, uh, you get to have conversations with folks about how uh, I'm giving you a twenty to forty thousand uh, dollar raise um, because you've been systemically underpaid for a long time. I think over the course of my career, I'm probably close to a quarter of a million dollars right now uh, in, in affecting pay equity. Um, so it's real. Pro tip, uh, when you do find these pay gaps, the only effective way to, make it, to fix this is to make people whole immediately. I've run all the experiments, I will tell you right now. I've done the slow catch up. I've done like the, the step function slow, uh, like halfway there thing. Like, this is the only thing that works. Right. Um, everything else is just perpetuating continued pay inequity. Right. So that's my pro tip. Uh, we wrote inclusivity into our career ladder. Right. We made it a point of performance. Um, the first thing we did here was we 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 took the stance that we were only going to promote you on demonstrated performance. Right. We're not going to promote you on potential. So let's make that clear. We set expectations at every level. Our junior engineers were responsible for, for contributing uh, and learning about our inclusive culture. As you became more senior, you, you took on mentorship and sponsorship opportunity, uh, responsibilities. Our uh, managers were responsible for hiring and retaining diverse teams. Uh, and our directors were responsible for implementing recruiting practices and policies that resulted in fair and equitable outcomes. Right. Uh, a note here that a bullet point in a career ladder doesn't do much unless you're willing to enforce it, right? But it does make sure that that conversation has an opportunity to happen, 
right? Um, and if you're thinking about doing this for yourself, I highly recommend this post by Chelsea Troy, uh, giving, talking about a rubric for evaluating inclusive behaviors. I found this after I rolled out this particular ladder, uh, but now that I'm a consultant, uh, I've incorporated a lot of these ideas into the ladders I've helped roll out since. So, uh, another link there. And finally, we interviewed for inclusion. And we weren't demure about it either. We asked people point blank, like how would you or how have you contributed to an inclusive culture? Crazy stories to tell you about answers from that question. Uh, but we were motivated to do this for a few reasons. Uh, the first is, if it was in our career ladder, and we were gonna be evaluating people about, uh, on this uh, going forward, it stood to reason that we should be sussing these behaviors out in, in the interview. Um, and the second is that one of the huge injustices that's happening right now in this moment is the burden of educating the majority group is being placed on the minority group, right? And so if we were going to continue to let folks in who in the door who were not clued in or educated or uh, uh, versed in the, in the concept of diversity and inclusion, the education of those new hires was gonna be a tax placed on our current underrepresented groups. And I wasn't ready, willing to let that happen. Um, and so that's all we did in affecting behavioral change. It is uncomfortable work. Uh, and I wish I could say that I acted with confidence and deafness through all of this stuff, uh, but I really can't. Uh, with almost every single one of these actions, uh, even knowing my motivations and principles, like I still had moments of doubt, right? Um, I still wondered if I was making too big of a deal out of something or if what I was asking was an appropriate use of someone's time. Um, to be clear, asking an engineer to, re, to take two days to rename an already working piece of software in production is very uncomfortable. Um, and sometimes these deliberations took me five to 10 minutes. Sometimes they took me hours or even days before I followed through. And I'm telling you this not because there's a gray area here, um, but I want you to know that in the moment, you may rarely feel certainty. Everything I just talked about took, over, took place over the course of about five months. Um, and there was still an unending list of things to tackle, right? Which is another thing that makes us work hard. There's always something more to do. Changing norms is not easy, right? Removing sexism and discrimination and racism from your, uh, is super difficult, right? So many of these behaviors are just ingrained in their second nature, right? It's that wink you give if you're crossing the street, right? It's that casual comment in the hallway. Uh, that off-color joke you tell at parties that has been getting laughs for years, right? But fairness and equity don't happen on their own, right? It is not a natural state of being. And this is the challenge, right? We are trying to create a new norm, one in which uh, fair outcomes and equitable treatment prevail. And I don't know about you all, but creating a new norm has been the promise of tech for as long as I've been a part of it. My job didn't exist when I was born. Senior director of an e-commerce company was just not a thing. I mean, the, even more real, like leadership coach and fractional VP of engineering was also not a thing. Um, I'm incredibly lucky that I live in a time where something I love to do is in high demand and pays extraordinarily well, right? The arbitrariness of those set of coincidences does not escape me. And I am just absolutely gutted at the idea that not everyone who wants to participate in this moment can. And that my time, I've been doing this for 20 years, my time in this industry will be marked by enabling a landscape, a technology landscape written by white men for white men. There's a coach's saying that goes, you only have to get 1% better every day. And if you can do that every day in 100 days, you'll be 100% better. And every time I hear this, I think, maybe coach didn't want to get into the intricacies of compound interest. <laughs> like it's, like it really, it's really hard to explain. It just hangs you up when you say it's 70 days and not 100 days. But coach, why is it 100 days? Or whatever. Um, whether you've been struggling to get started on this journey or whether you're well on your way, I'm hoping something in this talk has helped you find your 1% for the day. Um, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, comments, concerns? Going once. Going twice. 
All right. So, yeah. On your diversified social network, you talked yes. about um, encouraging others to follow other social networks that they wouldn't typically. Would you give us examples of some of those? Um, in a public context, I'm reluctant to do that, uh, simply because not everyone would like that kind of attention. Like, this team of 35, I was a little more comfortable. But, um, yeah, I I'm happy to talk in person if you'd like to. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, um, it is a slow change, right? Um, and you start to see little tiny behaviors. So. Over towards the end of those five months, I was getting folks saying, oh, like, this is interesting. I didn't know about these particular aspects of what it's like to be a woman in tech or what it's like to be black in tech. Um, how do I learn more, right? Or as we were doing compensation calibration, like, I no longer am the one that has to point out where the pay discrepancies are. Someone comes up to me and is like, hey, I noticed that on a whole, like, we're underpaying our women. I'm like, yes, yes, we are, right? Um, so those things start to happen. Like, what I don't talk about this is uh, all this work happened before we even set goals around diversity, right? Um, that was the next phase. That was going to be the next six months, which is like now that we are, now that we have some of this groundwork sort of uh, going, now we're going to measure, right? Now we're going to say 50% of our hires need to be underrepresented minorities. Yeah. Are you, uh, how are you getting a sense of the different you know, dimensions of difference working at your company, um, how, what people's personal experiences are, um, and whether they're improving or not as far as. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't know. Because of the power dynamics in the room, because of the social dynamics in the room, I don't know if I'll ever truly know, right? Um, so uh, I think. I think one of the ways that, uh, that I can take signal from is if, if people start feeling safe enough to share their experiences with me, I think that's a big, big marker, right? And then you definitely have to understand your role, my, like my role as a leader in this, and just to, to listen and take in. So what are your, a lot of what you talked about is that when you are in the leadership position, mm -hmm. position, what strategy do you have for your peers? Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, in my role, I went from managing 100 person to a peer right. to uh, and now I manage three people. Yeah. So I don't have quite that same level of control. How do you influence other leaders to take up these actions since you have less directive? Yeah, I generally, sh um, it depends on what your energy levels are for it. Um, usually the, the first thing that I try to focus on is like, what can I control? Like, how can I? Model behaviors, how can I lend privilege? How can I be an ally, right? And sort of share that load. Um, and it, it depends, and, and managing up is always a question of what your context is and what your, um, like for instance, all of the business case stuff, to me, is a nice to have, right? Like, I'm not particularly motivated by those business things, but I understand that having more reasons is better than having fewer reasons um, so that I can build the largest sort of, uh, uh, I guess, a uh, cohort possible. So if your manager is particularly business driven, you can use the business reasons. If they are uh, social, social, social justice driven, you can use the social justice reasons, right? So it's a, it's a mix and match, right? I can't, I don't know if I can really offer you too much there. So I think uh, <clears throat> I had a question in regards to inclusion. So I think we focus on the growth in the metrics of represented groups, mm -hmm. right, which is a great thing. Yeah. But I wonder if, or to you, if you attempted to, uh, I guess, analyze and follow matrix on the people who are not inclusive or you know, being whatever we're focused on attacking, do we get feedback from those people who feel like they actually made some type of change in their lives as far as diversity and inclusion so how do you kind of account for yeah, my experience is that most of the time, uh, the far vast majority of the folks are just unaware. Like, they're moving through life not fully, like, just unknowing of all of the challenges that the rest of us face, right? Um, and so, putting in those pieces of awareness are actually enough to start getting those changes to happen. 
I only ran into uh, one incident in an interview where someone refused to answer a question, or on, on the inclusion question. Um, so in that case, it's like, I'm comfortable saying this is who we are gonna be as an engineering organization, these are our values, and so you're not gonna be extended, we're not gonna extend an offer to this person, type of thing. Um, how it works internally, um, I think, again, it, what's nice about the career ladder is that you make your expectations clear. And so here are the expectations, here is what it takes to be a part of this organization, and I can let you decide if you wanna get in on this or if you wanna leave, right? Yeah. It's important for even the people who are unaware to really learn and discover about themselves. Right. right? Because like you said, oh, yeah. subconscious sometimes, so some people may not know. Right? And I think them also being able to say, okay, this is where I started, and I had this perspective, mm -hmm. you know, and then seeing like, oh, this change through this action or this correction. Yeah. Right? I think that's just as powerful as the other side. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I, I didn't do anything to, to measure that, though, but it's an interesting thing that it's worth looking into. Hi, I have a question for you. So I love that you mentioned the allyship training. I mm -hmm. have a lot of vision diversity for Honeywell, our software startup. Yeah. So curious, for your allyship training, like, we're probably maybe the, I don't know, like the high peaks of that and the low moments, like, what did you find was very helpful with your team? Yeah. With, you know, introducing to that kind of, you know, um, allyship training, yeah. and, like, and what are some like, things you wish you could have done better? <laughs> yeah, the best part of that allyship training was um, afterwards, uh, everyone in the room was pointing out all of the ways in which we were not being allies, right? And we were not acting in inclusive ways. It's like, oh, we're doing this. And then they're like, and then it was like this weird thing where uh, I think in some ways they're holding me responsible. They're like, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? Why is this? Like, yes, um, <laughs> absolutely. So that was the most beneficial thing. I think it's, uh, one of, what I would do differently is I probably would have done it earlier. I had this talk in the bank uh, for a while and I just never, I just didn't get around to it um, for whatever reason. So I would have just done it more often and, and earlier. Do you have copies of like the career ladder or the inclusion questions you asked in interviews that you can share? Uh, I have a blog post about the inclusion, interviewing inclusion stuff, uh, so I can send that to you. Um, but the career ladder, uh, the career ladder change over time, and I, and so I would not. I don't know how many of my secrets do I want to give away here, um, because part of my consulting work is I help people roll out career ladders. Uh, <laughs> um, I would say I'm happy to share one-on-one. -on -one. I don't. I, some of that information now is because of client work. It's it's uh, non-shareable. The reason I ask is um, I just helped create career ladders where I work. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot in there about like um, going like soft skills and like mentorship right. and um, professional development. But we didn't really think to put things about inclusion in there. Yeah. And I'd love to. It's a living document. Like we're able to update it. Kind of yeah. Um, I'd love to see us put more of that. Yeah. Uh, there's a slide on Jess's deck that has a lot of great stuff. Um, is what I'll say about it. Yeah. Do you put stuff in your public job descriptions uh, about inclusion, or is it only once they get to the interview? Yeah, I would rather show it, rather, like demonstrate it, rather than peacock it. Um, so I do, we do use Textio, right? Text is, is everyone familiar with it? this thing where you can put your job descriptions through and uh, uh, it, it surfaces like the gender language in, that you're using or the non-inclusive language that you're using. Um, it's really helpful. Um, so uh, there's that bit of it. Um, I think there are ways in which you can craft your job description um, that lead to better outcomes, right? Like are your requirements really your, your requirements? Um, like how many, like if it's a long list of things, like you, if you shorten that up, like You'll, you'll get a lot, a lot better results. Um, there's a lot about, um, what was I about to say? There's a, there, there's a lot in sort of how do you recognize or encourage folks from non-traditional tech backgrounds, right, uh, to apply and evaluate them as well in the, in the process. So I think those are some interesting areas. Just regarding the talk, so 
Yeah. Let me know if you've already covered this. So I'm curious, like I'm at um, a sort of early startup that is starting to do some of this work. Mm -hmm. And a big question that's come up a lot in the process for us is like, how do we create an inclusive culture that doesn't rely on the labor of people that don't get yeah. Because it is stressful. Right. Um, Siri's got an answer for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot, so that's where I really view a lot of the importance of allyship is to share that load and spread that load. Um, like I, I did mention in the talk, like one of the big injustices that's happened right now is like the education of the majority is being placed in the minority group. Like, you know, when people want to know about the experience of being black in tech, they get they go find the first black person they know, right? Which like, um, versus, um, or if they feel uneducated, like, and it's like uh, it's this weird thing where, like, it's a meme. Like, if you have an engineering problem, you go to Stack Overflow, right, and look it up. You go to Google, and look it up. But if we have this this other set of problems, like, I don't know how to find an answer. Um, so, uh, I do focus a lot on like. If you have questions, like come to talk to me. Like I will take on uh, some of your inquiries, right? Um, and I will, uh, I will try to shoulder that as much as possible. Um, but it is, um, it is a lot of uh, you need buy-in from a lot of folks, a wide set of folks, so that uh, there's not one sort of person shouldering it. There's also a lot of stuff going on in the, in the tech space right now in terms of tools for diversity inclusion. Uh, there's this company called Crescendo right now, which is like a, a diversity education platform that integrates into Slack. And so the idea is that uh, it's sort of a self-learning, self-guided program, and they can map like who has seen what classes to what, how the, the conversations that are, they're, they're having in Slack and how some of the behaviors are changing, which is interesting. Uh, we got two minutes, so probably time for one more question if anyone has one. I'm interested. Um, have you noticed, uh, and it might not be appropriate, but the turnover rate ratio for this process? Uh, the turnover ratio. Yeah. Um, I can tell you about from my time at Etsy. Uh, so the story about Etsy is that uh, we were, when I joined, I think 95% men in engineering. Our user base was probably 90% women. Um, we were building the wrong products all over the place, right? And, uh, and so a gentleman by the name of Mark Hedlund uh, really brought this sort of uh, diversity initiative uh, into Etsy. And we partnered with uh, this organization called the Recurse Center. Back then it was called Hacker School. We offered scholarships. Uh, we, ho we hosted them in our, um, in our uh, offices. And um, over the course of that relationship, I think probably within a year or maybe a little bit over a year, we went from like 5% women to 15, 18, 19% women. Um, and after we did that, we're like, mission accomplished, done. Um, pat on the back. Uh, and then we went on our merry way. And over time, uh, those numbers started dipping, right? And I think as a leadership team, I was part of the leadership team at, at this time as well, we were like, don't worry about it, it's not a big deal, right? And our underrepresented minorities were saying, this is, this is freaking us out. Like, we don't want to see this happen. They were like, eh, it's okay. Like, these are just really small numbers, and so anyone who leaves is like, it's going to have an outsized effect. And we just didn't listen. It took us very long to listen. Um, and then, I'm telling you this story because what, that, what happened during that time was that women were, were being told that they were never going to be successful, that they chose the wrong career, uh, that they shouldn't be doing this, um, and of course they left, right? Like why would you, why would you stick around for that, right? And so um, when we started changing our approach from a diversity first uh, strategy to an inclusion first uh, effort, we saw much better retention numbers, right? And that's how we were able to get to the 35% in my organization. Uh, we're, t we're at time, so thank you all very much. Uh, yeah, if you can find me on Twitter at Attack Echo, uh, LinkedIn, whatever, I'm happy to answer any more questions. I'll be hanging around for the rest of the day. Thank you.